Commissioner of Defence Marketing Group in the Australia India Chamber of Commerce (AICC), inviting Mr. Dimitri, he is Director General JSC Langsova, and we also have Mr. Matthew Weiss, Councillor Space Embassy of France India, and Dr. Vinod Kumar, Director PD in Space. Once again, inviting our chair, Mr. R. Uma Maheshwaran, Director HSFC, ISRO. The keynote speaker, Honorary Dr. Mike Short, CBE, Chief Scientific Advisor, Department of International Trade, UK. Warm welcome. And the moderator, Ms. R. Anita Nandini. Ms. Nandini is here with us. May I invite Ms. Harriet, our speaker? She's not in the room yet. She's not in the room yet. See, I can't. Not easy to miss her. I'm happy to start and we'll. Oh, uh, yes, sir. So I think uh, while we are waiting for other people to join us, we will begin with the keynote address by Honorary Dr. Mike Short, CBE. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much for the introduction. So it's my great honor as Chief Scientist for the UK Government in Trade to uh, chair this particular session. Uh, the topic is very much around international collaboration, and, and some of my guests are here, but I, I've been assured that some of the other guests will be here very soon. So uh, I hope to be joined on stage by the other guests. Um, it seems very important to start with the, the principle, why international collaboration? So I thought I'd just say a few summary words by way of introduction on this subject. I think the first point about international collaboration is that ideas just don't stop at the border. Ideas flow around the world more quickly than ever before. Uh, certainly from the world of mobile communications, where I come from, uh, we see innovation everywhere. But scale does matter, and therefore understanding uh, what is happening around the world is very important, but also embracing ideas from wherever they come from is also important. Secondly, I think space um, is actually growing international interest in terms of its excitement as, as to what it can do for every country. What we can see is it's very important for skills and career development internationally. Some people trained in one country may choose a career somewhere else. So from an international collaboration point of view, it's a good career development path uh, to think about skills from an international point of view. Also, I think we know that ideas and talent are not spread equally around the world. So there may be some countries that look for help, particular help around how can those ideas and talent spread around the world more quickly. Collaboration in that area certainly helps. Welcome. We also need to think about the investment side of international collaboration. Many investors are international in nature, and that is not evenly spread either. Harriet, welcome. You've got a seat over here on my right, I think. <laughs> Sorry for those just arriving. We had to start, otherwise we knew we'd run out of time. So investment needs an international collaboration flavor. Certainly international investors look at the countries by opportunity, but they might also look at it for scale, and that might be multi-country. We also know that uh, spreading R&D and technology internationally is very important to reduce unit costs. Economies of scale is what the economists talk about, and in, in particular, sharing that R&D across many countries helps to reduce the cost for everybody. My best example is that mobile phones are roughly two billion a year shipped, manufactured and shipped from all over the world. That's helped to reduce the cost of mobile phones for everybody. We see this with other international markets, such as automotive. Spreading the costs across many boundaries is very important. I think we also know internationally that spectrum is global. And in terms of some of the usage of spectrum, it makes more sense to have consistent spectrum policies internationally. It certainly supports economies of scale. International standards are also very helpful because they help with adoption, but also helping to keep the cost down if the standards are set properly. I think deviating from international standards also has the opposite effect. 
So it's better to try and retain international standards to minimize uh, the cost per unit. International security, I think, is also a consideration where we need to understand each other's values, but also security concerns and indeed the opportunities that may arise. So I think those are just eight areas for potential international coll collaboration. Um, I think now that my panel is fully here, what I might do is ask each of them to introduce themselves briefly, perhaps starting with Anita, far right. Thank you. Uh, very good afternoon to everybody. My name is Anita Nandini. I'm uh, basically a foreign service officer uh, working with Ministry of External Affairs and currently I am posted with the Department of Space. I handle the international cooperation and the policy for Department of Space. Thank you. Want, want to. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dmitry Laskotov, Director General of GLAF Cosmos, which is basically a commercial arm of Roscosmos, Russian Space Agency. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Harriet Brettel. I'm the Head of Market Analysis and Business Intelligence uh, at the European Space Agency for our Telecommunications Directorate. Hello, good morning, uh, rather, rather good afternoon. I'm Dr. Mama Heswaran. I'm Director of Human Space Flight Center, ISRO. And uh, I assume today I'm the chair of this session. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Mahadevan Shankar. I'm representing the Australia India Chamber of Commerce. And this morning we just signed up an MOU with SATCOM. Otherwise, I'm involved in a couple of think tanks where we think, not sync. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Matt Weiss. I'm um, the uh, Councillor of Space at the Embassy of France uh, here in India. But I'm also the permanent representative uh, of the French uh, Space Agency in the country. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Vinod Kumar, Director Promotion in, in Space, that is Indian National Space Promotion and Authorization Center. It's a newly created body for uh, allowing private sector participation in this space. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so now w I would like to invite uh, Dr. Uma Mayeshwaran to deliver the keynote speech, please. Very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, the dignitaries on the dais, Dr. Mike Schott, my colleague and friend, uh, Mrs. Anita, Mr. Sangha, Madam Harriet, Mr. Madhavan Shankar, my friend, uh, Dimitri Luskatov, my another friend, Vaith Smativeis, uh, Dr. Jukka Holapa, and of course, another friend. There are a lot of friends here, Dr. Vinod Kumar, and also the dignitaries of the dais. I'm seeing many familiar faces here also. So once again, a very good afternoon. So first of all, again, let me thank the organizers here of the Indian Space Congress, especially SA India, for giving me an opportunity to stand before you and participate in this very, very well, nicely organized conference. Morning we had a session, it was very lively. I'm sure the participants, the number of participants here in front of me indicates the interest that is being shown in this specific subject, which is of course international collaboration. And uh, as uh, the, our keynote speaker, Dr. Mike Short was briefing in the beginning, the, he has emphasized the points or the essentiality of international collab collaboration. And as far as uh, we are concerned, when I say we, especially I, I represent ISRO, Department of Space, collaboration is the kind of uh, real key word as far as any activity of or with related to space is concerned. 
as I was mentioning in the morning, when we began our space odyssey in 1963 in a sleepy village called Veli in the southernmost part of uh, India in a small state called Kerala. Incidentally, Kerala is known as God's own country. So there, when the whole space program started with the uh, launching of a Nike Apache sounding rocket, that itself was a classic demonstration of collaboration, wherein the Nike Apache rocket was from USA, and the payload, basically it's a sodium vapor related payload, it was brought from the Israel CNES by the, the great scientist Jacques Mamo. He brought it in his, in his own hand and uh, gave it to Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, our uh, father of Indian space program, for this first launch. So from that time onwards, ISRO is uh, very religiously following the basic fundamental concept of having collaboration. Collaboration is a very key word. Subsequently, we went, when we went ahead with our subsequent sounding rocket programs, then we, uh, when we, I graduated, I would say, to satellite launch vehicle as such, SLV-3, then followed by augmented satellite launch vehicle, then the workhorse PSLV, and later the GSLV Mark II with the two-ton capability to GEO, and then very recently we have that biggest rocket that we have made, GSLV Mark LVM-3, four-ton with the four-ton capability to uh, geo. Orbit collaboration has been the one of the key ingredients of, of, of our success. I have no hesitation to say that. The first uh, remote sensing satellite uh, which we call as uh, Aryabhata that was launched as you all know from Russia. Similarly the first communication satellite if you talk about Apple, Arian passenger payload experiment that was launched with uh, Arian uh, launcher. If you talk about uh, uh, the cryogenic uh, stage, even though we, we developed our own capability, our own indigenously developed engine by 2014, successfully demonstrated, from 2000 onwards we, we were flying the cryo stage which was given to us by Russia, Glad Cosmos team. Of course, initially we wanted the technology but Due to the geopolitical scenario, we could not get the technology, but uh, we could get the completed stage as such. Seven stages were given to us, and we used those stages initially for our preliminary launches of GSLV Mark II in, from 2000 to 2012 period. By the time we developed our own indigenous uh, in the cryogenic engine, which has been further upgraded to our C20 cryogenic engine, which is purely 100% Indian design which has been flying in a GSLV uh, LVM3 launcher, which is also slated to take the humans uh, to space, our Gaganyan program. So again, the collaboration is something which has really helped us in creating the, our own capability in, uh, in making the technology ourselves, Atmandar Bharata. And I, I can also say that the denial of technology due to certain geopolitical situations also is one factor which has urged us to become Atmanar Bharata. That only helped us really in many ways to see that we develop or not. That part is also there, but the essence of collaboration is always there. As far as uh, the kind of uh, interfaces that we have, as of now, if I understand correctly, we have more than 250 kind of memorandum of understanding with more than 61 countries across the world. So that is a kind of international uh, relations that we have. Apart from uh, when I talked about US or CNES or when we talked about uh, Russia, we have very good uh, interactions with them. You take the Gaganyan program. The Gaganyan program also is not only an ISRO program, as I said earlier, it's a pan-India program where there are m uh, many stakeholders in India, but it is also an international program in the sense we have very strong collaboration with Russia with respect to astronaut training. We have very good uh, collaboration with CNES as far as the, uh, the physiological part of the astronauts are concerned and also the other uh, 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 the kind of uh, materials uh, which we need, some of the very critical materials which we need as far as the Gaganyan program is concerned. Similarly with NASA, with Australia, we are having very good tie-up 
with respect to ground stations. So everywhere, we, this Gaganyan program cannot be achieved without international collaboration. So collaboration becomes again an essence of that. Similarly, the, our, our interactions with the various countries as part of the various international organizations. We go to UN Copas or we go to uh, Vienna or we go to Geneva for various, uh, like, you know, uh, you have the UN Copas, for example, we have IADC, you, are, you have got COSPAR, wherein the kind of deliberations, interactions that we have during these sessions also help us to collaborate better. We try, the face-to-face -face interactions help us to understand each other, try to understand, and we, we, we are able to understand the requirement of the other person so that whether we will be able to have a solution which is a win-win situation for all of us is uh, this, the, these uh, uh, programs or these kind of uh, conferences or meeting grounds enable us for better collaboration. So this is what I would like to communicate uh, that uh, our the, the program of space program that we are uh, conducting or the space programs that we are uh, envisaging in future also, this collaboration always will be one of the uh, one of the more you know, important ingredients as far as our program is concerned. So I'll stop for the time being. There are other speakers now. We will listen to them and then probably we'll have a detailed debate on this. Thank you very much. Over to Nandini. Thank you, sir. Uh, dear audience, uh, what you heard here was Dr. Omar Maheshwaran sir's experience as a scientific secretary as of ISRO. Uh, apart from that, I forgot to mention that he is also the chair of the LTS committee with respect to United Nations. He also heads the Indian delegation which leads the Indian interest in the United Nations. So thank you, sir. Thanks for covering the entire topic in in, in such a brief uh, uh, speech. Uh, I would like to next move on to our next speaker of yeah <laughs> thank you. So uh, let me introduce the next speaker. We have uh, Harriet Brittle. She's the head of market analysis and business intelligence at the European Space Agency in the Telecoms and Integrated Applications Directorate. Uh, in this role, Harriet is responsible for the analysis of markets relevant to connectivity and space solutions. Prior to joining ESA, Harriet was head of business analysis at Astroscale and was also the chair of the Space Generation Advisory Council. With a background in finance, having worked at the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, as well as a master's degree in planetary science and bachelor's degree in mathematics. Wow. Harriet is passionate about commercial sustainability and emerging market opportunities within the space ecosystem. I think this is a remarkable bio profile many of us would envy. Harriet, please, we are waiting to listen to you. Please. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for, for having me here. It's a real honor to be in New Delhi to be speaking on uh, the importance of international collaboration. Um, so I wanted to start by uh, talking a little bit about the European Space Agency, uh, why uh, we consider international collaboration to be critically important, and to give some concrete examples of ways that we have uh, engaged with uh, different countries and agencies around the world. I'd also just like to, to reinforce that I'm, I'm here at this conference because I want to meet as many people as I can uh, to see how we can strengthen uh, collaborations between the European Space Agency, European industry and India. Uh, so please do uh, come say hello or ask questions during the panel. I'm very happy to, to discuss any of these points further. So the European Space Agency is, is by definition built on the foundation of international collaboration. We have 22 different member states that come together through the European Space Agency. Uh, and one of the values of that, that uh, combined approach means that we can uh, deliver more for our space agency uh, than any one country can, can deliver alone. And that's really something we see as the value of uh, international collaboration uh, throughout the world. Um, space is an inherently international endeavor. I think Mike touched on the value of international collaboration uh, much more eloquently than I can. So I'll just build on that with a, a few concrete examples uh, of how we at the European Space Agency have looked to collaborate beyond Europe 
um, in an international framework and want to continue doing that in the future. Uh, so, as a, as a first, my first example is at the uh, International Astronautical Congress in Paris last month. Uh, ESA and uh, NASA signed a collaborative agreement to work towards further uh, lunar exploration ambitions, and part of that included looking at uh, lunar communication systems and collaborations there. Um, we're also working uh, with uh, trying to find ways to support European and in international industry to, to come together. So we talk here about what, what is the role of a space agency in fostering international collaboration. I think that can be done in, in two ways. One is through direct engagements agency to agency, but it's also an opportunity to foster industry collaborations internationally as well. So a specific example of that is we recently signed an agreement with a company in Luxembourg who is uh, developing uh, quantum technologies through quantum key distribution using satellites. Uh, we were able to support their endeavors to partner with a company based in Singapore. And so the, through the collaboration between the European Space Agency and the uh, Office for Space Technology in Singapore, Austin, we're able to support and fund an international collaboration between our respective industries. Uh, we also have a number of uh, projects that work on downstream and space solutions, so looking at how we can apply space, uh, space technology and space applications uh, to support uh, the common man or the common woman, I might say. Um, and this is a, uh, something that we do internationally. We work with a number of international partners, some of which are in uh, India as well. And so across all of these different ways that we see that we can explore international collaboration, I'd be very keen to, to find more ways that we can build those relations with, with India as well. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Harriet. Uh, next, we'll move on to our next speaker. I would like to uh, introduce Mr. Mahadevan. Uh, Mr. Mahadevan is founder and CEO of Azu International, brings along over 25 years of global professional experiences in providing strategic transaction advisory services. Key sectors include defense, manufacturing, extractive sector, um, resources industries of mining and oil and gas, education sector, infrastructure projects, including road sports, and energy, financial services, and real estate. Uh, Mr. Mahadevan is actively advising few Australian space industry startups and established companies. Mr. Mahadevan has past experiences in interacting with agencies in India, such as uh, ISRO, ENSEL, and Antrix. In his capacity as national convener of Defence Working Group in the Australia-India Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Mahadevan is promoting increased partnerships and collaboration on B2B basis between both countries. May I invite you to share your thoughts with us, please? Thanks, Anita. Uh, for those who didn't know who was speaking, that the lady out here, most of them were trying to spot you out there. So hopefully she'll stand at the lectern, the next one. Uh, yeah, so I would like to first of all acknowledge Mr. Uma Maheshwari. He's made a fantastic speech this morning, which was pretty informative. And I think that set the tone of collaborations. Um, Mr. Michael Short yesterday gave some fantastic uh, inputs into the round table. And those eight, A's, eight S's I've written somewhere and kept to our friend from Moscow, Dobrudin. Hopefully we'll catch up soon. And bonjour, monsieur, I'll be keen to hear what the French are doing because there's plenty that's going on between French, Australia, and India also in collaborations on critical minerals. And I think there's plenty going on at the Quad. So I wear a few hats. And one of the hats I wear is with reference to my friends on the first table there. I'm an adjunct fellow of the National Maritime Foundation of India. And I never realized the amount of inputs that space can have in the maritime space. And in the past year and a half, there have been so many articles that have been written as to the impact of space, satellites, technologies that can be there. In fact, I'm working with a, it's no longer a startup, an Indian origin guy who set up an entity in Perth in Western Australia, and he is launching a constellation of satellites. It's just amazing the amount of feedback that they have got from the maritime sector in terms of the sea lines of uh, communications, the slots and the merchant shipping. 
So there's plenty of collaboration that can happen between the space and the maritime forces. A couple of weeks ago, I was attending the land forces event in Brisbane, where electronic warfare equipment was being put on display, and I'm talking of defense issues out here. So in the defense area, I think last evening we spoke about cyber security and cyberspace and cyber command. Uh, considering the future is all about space and everything is Wi-Fi and digital and you know, in the past six months India has been averaging 60 billion digital transactions so there could be plenty of opportunities for cyber security and cyberspace issues to be considered in uh, international collaborations. On the civilian side there is plenty of uh, geospatial conversations that are happening between Australia and India. Uh, the Australian companies have advanced significantly in using space technology, especially in the agriculture and water management aspects of it. I believe there's good demand from India to try and collaborate with the Australian companies over there. Hopefully, I've got a few uh, moving already. Uh, one of the points which Mr. Umashankar touched upon is how can the universities and educational institutions partner with each other? And this little hero out here, Venkat, when I saw him with his jacket, stand up, let everybody see you. I mean, he's just nine years old. And he said a few things which blew me away. And possibly at that age, I had seen Captain Rakesh Sharma fly up as the first astronaut of India. And that's what triggered my interest in space. I wanted to be an Air Force pilot. I wanted to be a cosmonaut. And then I became a chartered accountant. <laughs> And here, my unfinished karma has brought me back into the Space Congress. So, you've got to dream big. And, and I just loved the conversation I had with him. And I think Mr. Mameshwana also is hopefully going to help him in a few areas. But besides this, the space, now, there is potential for things from ground to be involved in space. Now, why I say ground is because critical minerals, rare earth, rare earth metal technology in Australia is pretty big. Outside of China, Australia has some good capacity in terms of rare earth manufacturing. They are interested to talk to India. They are interested to set up joint ventures in India. It's a question of how can their IP be protected and certain legal infrastructure has to be put in place. So there is some conversations happening. Critical minerals, um, like I said, besides France, Australia, India, there's also a J that is happening, Japan, Australia, India. And Quad is working seriously towards identifying critical mineral supply chains and how these will be impacting the future of space technology, especially when you talk of microprocessors and uh, chips, supercomputer chips. Uh, so those things will need all these technologies and minerals. And Australia is one big continent that's just digging a lot of holes and exporting it to the rest of the world. So you mentioned about Atman Nirbharta. Besides India, in fact, Australia is also looking at it from a self-reliance perspective. Because after what's happening in Ukraine, Australia realized that their stock of inventory of missiles and munitions, one week, 10 days, it will be all over. So they need to have their own little ecosystem where they can manufacture and produce. And space plays an important role in that because it's one continent so far. They have been enjoying life, but nowadays everything is moving pretty much at high speed where Instead of a 10-year horizon, Australia is looking at one, two-year horizons. Like, what are the threats in the nearby region? Uh, the South Pacific region, I can talk about that also because I'm involved in some countries like Papua New Guinea and Fiji. They want to engage with India. They want to have their own satellites. And these are countries that are huge in terms of fisheries with the kind of uh, ec exclusive economic zones that they have. So space can play an important role. I think this morning, Mr. Umar mentioned, someone touched on it. How can the fisherman in the high seas sell his product before he comes or at least talk about his product before he's landed on the shore? So if you take small countries like Palau, Kiribati, Solomon Islands, they need it. And if India is there, India has the technology, Australia wants India to participate in that region, how can India launch a satellite and tell them this is for 14, 15 countries in the South Pacific, Use it for whatever you want. We'll support you on the ground, create capacity. Telemetry station, I think he touched upon that. Australia, far north Queensland is ideal, closer to the equator. Northern Territory, plenty of space. I mean, 
five acres is required, but I think Australia can easily give 500 acres also to set up a telemetry station and still not blink their eyes. So the South Pacific region is something where India can and should play an important role in helping them with their space requirements, not just because of global warming. Yes, global warming is impacting them. In fact, I was talking to a gentleman out of Tonga. He spent three years at Manipal Institute of Technology doing geopolitical studies, and he reached out to me through one of the think tanks like National Maritime Foundation. I'm involved There's something called Current and Strategic Affairs. So he reached out and said, how do I engage with India? I would love to get Tonga to engage with India. We want some technologies. We want something to do. So I put him on to the Indian High Commissioner in Fiji, who is accredited to Tonga, and the conversation has started. So there is potential for India to go. The Indo-Pacific region is far beyond the Indian Ocean region. It's wide. Uh, there was an MOU signed earlier this year between ISRO and Australian Space Agency. And thanks to that, I have seen a massive eye-opening conversation with the space agencies in each of the states and territories of Australia. Queensland has got a few companies that are launching their own little rockets and testing it. In fact, NASA did a couple of launches from Queensland in the past few months. Uh, South Australia, which has been the hotbed of a lot of the military and Navy and uh, aerospace uh, capabilities, they are very seriously interested. I'm talking to Defence South Australia, who's the government arm. A couple of them are part of my Defence and Security National Working Group in the Australian Indian Chamber of Commerce. They want to come in with a delegation, if possible. Some of their startup companies from uh, their ecosystem have visited Bangalore last month in September, and they participated, and all of them were pretty shocked at what they saw over there. Uh, one last thing before I end is, you know, yesterday I mentioned this, which I would like to leave this for a moderator, Anita Nandanan, uh, Nandini, who can take it forward possibly at her level also. How do we get young girls involved? How do you get women involved into a lot of this? You know, when I saw all those women dancing and cheering because the woman leader was of the Mangalya mission, first thing I did was I recorded it, showed it to my daughter and said, hey, you know what, there's potential for you also. So I told her, no peer pressure, no father pressure. Just think about it. Space is the limit, sky is the limit. So there is potential for it. And if we start doing things of collaboration with France, with UK, with US, with Australia, even with the developing countries, do it at the educational level at schools and colleges. There's one month courses, three month courses. Corporate executives can come. In fact, just before we came here, possibly we got late because I threw an offer to Harriet that we could poach her from the European Space Agency and bring her to India. Um, you know, so far the brain drain has been out of India, now time to brain drain back into India. So I'll end, end with that. Over to you. Back. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for the inputs and the questions too. <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah. Okay, so moving on uh, to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Dimitri Lusktov the Director General of GLAV Cosmos. Uh, I would like to introduce him formally. Um, Mr. Dimitri has been appointed as the Director General since 2018 in GLAV Cosmos. He has graduated from Shuash State University with a degree in law. Until 2004, he worked in the Ministry of Justice of the Russian Federation, engaged in the examination of regulatory legal acts. He has had exposure to, uh, to handling foreign affairs. He has worked with the Department of Security and Disarmament Affairs of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and dealt with issues of international military and technical cooperation and protection of intellectual property rights. He has also worked uh, for the permanent mission of the Russian Federation to NATO, first as a third and second secretary and then headed the Defense and Military Technical Cooperation Group. He supervised the projects of Russian NATO Council in air traffic control, use of helicopters, and military transport aviation. He has also held uh, positions as Assistant Deputy Chairman of the Russian government, uh, Dmitry Rogozin. There, he was responsible for international contacts, oversaw the work of a number of bilateral intergovernmental commissions on economic cooperation, issues of international military and technical cooperation, 
and interagency activities related to trans Nester. So he has been, it's, it's a long, impressive bio profile. Okay, so uh, coming to the most important part, he's also awarded a second class medal for the Order of Merit for the Motherland. Let me introduce, let me, let me call you upon, sir, to please share your thoughts with us. Thank you. Thank you very much for such a long introduction. Uh, I moved to this position from the uh, director of the International Cooperation Department of Roscosmos, the Russian Space Agency. So uh, hopefully I know what, what I will be talking about today. Uh, how it started, uh, Dr. Short already mentioned how it's going. It's kind of going uh, in quite a sort of a different way. But for us, for Glove Cosmos, as the commercial arm of the Russian Space Agency, it all started in 1985 when we were established as a main directorate for the peaceful use of the results of space activities for national economy and for international cooperation. Uh, Dr. Mama Hesharan mentioned that we helped with the cryogenic stage. Uh, I think it was in the early 90s. And immediately after that, we fell under the U.S. sanctions, by the way. And this is, this is a matter of fact how it's all working. I mean, this, the system of checks and balances, export control, and so on. That was quite a long time ago. But anyway, today we are operating in a more and more contested environment, I would say. Now, even given the fact that we're in the international cooperation sphere, market, things are uh, not getting easier. Many of the speakers at different panels mentioned that the space is, is becoming more uh, militarized and then sometimes, unfortunately, even purely peaceful uh, scientific projects are being thrown under the bus just, just because there are certain political discrepancies. But uh, let me talk about, uh, about what we're doing today. This year, it has been quite a busy year uh, for Roscosmos, for Glove Cosmos even a more busy October in terms of rocket launches into space. Uh, we've had uh, six, um, six uh, launches uh, this October from three different spaceports, Russian spaceports, uh, using all three main types of launch vehicles, the Soyuz, Angara, and Proton. Three of the launches were from Plesetsk, from the military spaceports in the north of Russia. Uh, two from Baikonur in Kazakhstan, one of them for our foreign partner, for that, that was a commercial launch on a heavy proton vehicle. Another one just was launched a couple of days ago, a uh, spacecraft, a cargo spacecraft to the International Space Station. And the sixth launch was uh, from Vostochny, the newest Russian spaceport. Um, the, the Soyuz rocket carried the three Garnets um, uh, communication satellites as well as the first satellite, which is named, uh, which is named, well, anyway, it's a new satellite, Skiv d demonstrator, uh, for the new Russian constellation, multi-satellite constellation, which is called Sphera. Um, and I believe there will be a couple more launches this year. Speaking of our, one of our core businesses, uh, launching secondary payloads, including for our foreign customers, uh, we are expecting at least uh, two uh, federal launches next year with uh, secondary payloads. Uh, one of them is fully booked already. Now, another area of uh, cooperation which is of interest to, to our foreign customers is commercial space flights, human space flights, to the ISS. Uh, Glove Cosmos ordered uh, a spacecraft and a rocket. They are being manufactured now and they're supposed to be ready to fly in the second half of 2024, so there is a, still a place for two potential commercial space tourists there. Um, turnkey solutions, we're really doing a lot to provide uh, uh, spacecraft to be launched into space, uh, building ground infrastructure, training personnel, and all the, the kind of stuff that is related to, to um, uh, space launches, and uh, ISRO is one of our best and trusted partners in this regard, including the Gaganyan project that was mentioned here several times. And uh, finally, another, another area of our uh, commercial attention, I would say, is uh, space merge, which is something that, that does not generate huge cash flow, but uh, you know, just before, a couple of months before uh, the COVID outbreak in uh, 2019, we launched a 
internet web store for all the space merch, like t-shirts, all kinds of accessories. By the way, the European Space Agency has a very nice uh, space shop as well. Um, uh, they promote it in a very, in quite a uh, nice way. And by the way, in Bangalore, last, uh, last month, when we were also present at the Space Expo, I've noticed a, uh, a booth with the space merge. I'm not sure it was on behalf of Easter or not, but there were some very nice accessories there as well. That, uh, I'm talking about that because that helps bring space closer to, to, to the general public and to, to, to the young people, which are also interested in such you know, small little things. Um, so, uh, once again, I would like to mention, I did on my speech, that I would like to congratulate uh, wholeheartedly ISRO on the successful launch of 36 one web satellites. Uh, this is a really, really uh, a huge uh, leap, I would say, into, even in terms of uh, integration of these satellites onto a new rocket. That was quite impressive in terms of, in terms of, the, in terms of the timing. I believe it took like five, up to four to five months to do that. And uh, uh, I would love to, to wish you all and to, to our Indian uh, friends uh, to keep up the pace. We're really learning from you a lot, learning how to, how to talk to the private industry. The Russian government now is paying a lot more attention to the private space companies, providing them ground infrastructure just as well as you are providing them your infrastructure. And uh, that is no wonder because there are so many Indians uh, in, in the, in the well-known companies. I believe, the, if I'm not mistaken, the head of Microsoft, IBM, uh, Google, MasterCard, they're all Indians. Even the Prime Minister, the, the, congratulations, Dr. Short, uh, uh, the new British Prime Minister is of an Indian origin. Uh, the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris, also has, her mother was born in India. So I think you should use this opportunity in terms of international cooperation as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to now invite uh, Matt Ways. Uh, Ms. Matt Ways has been, is currently the managing director of the French space agency lies in office. He is a career diplomat and currently with the embassy of France. Uh, Indian Kenes has had a really good working relationship. I would like to now invite you to share your thoughts on that, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me and uh, welcome to all of you. Um, as uh, Mr. Umamash Varam said, uh, the story between uh, France and India is, goes back to 60 years now, or next year it will be 60 years. Um, and uh, I'd like to stress maybe something that hasn't been said until now on international cooperation is that um, uh, this all is a human adventure. So if we go back to 60 years of history, which I can testimony between India and France, and it's seen as a model, you know, I've been in, inter in space cooperation since quite a long time. And always I have uh, uh, people uh, telling me uh, that uh, they admire this story between India and France, between, because it's very unique in uh, the in the international cooperation models uh, worldwide. Since the marriage has been there forever, we have never been uh, unfaithful. <laughs> so we have always been together during 60 years, can you imagine? Even during historical moments that were not as easy, uh, you know, and I'm talking about geopolitics, and uh, I'm relating this also to the situation today. We have stayed together and we have managed to do something which is linked to more than technology, to human friendship and a little bit more of that probably. But um, people like each other, people work with each other in a way that uh, cannot be described as only a work relationship. And uh, okay, that was my introductory statement and I think it's very important because we have the chance to have this in space. It's not uh, uh, necessarily the case in all other sectors. I think it is because space conveys 
a certain amount of passion. And uh, so this makes things a little different. So why India and France? Because we have a common vision of independence, of autonomy, which is a geopolitical or a political vision we have always had. I mean, since after World War II for us and since after independence for India. We are small or, well, India is not that small, but um, we don't want to be told by others what we have to do. So we want to be independent. And uh, we have found in India a partner which is very much on that line. And I think this has forged, if, I, if, if we can think back a little bit at the story of all of it, this was the center point which has forged this um, uh, partnership still today. And uh, we are looking at uh, many topics now. We have uh, uh, extended, uh, you know, our uh, cooperation uh, started with launches uh, where uh, French rockets were shipped in wooden boxes to India, assembled in Kerala and launched from India. And then uh, we have uh, built uh, rocket engines together. Uh, many people may not know that uh, the, liquid, uh, um, the liquid propulsion engine used on Ariane 4, which is a ESA launch vehicle, was co-developed between uh, French engineers from Société Européenne de Propulsion and ISRO engineers in the 70s. So this engine which flew on the Ariane rocket is, uh, is actually an Indo-European engine. And uh, it is still produced by Godrej in uh, Mumbai. And it is flying on all the Indian rockets including the GSLV. And uh, this is a great proudness. Of course, it's history. And we should look into the future, but history is important. Then we did a lot on climate change. We have uh, today two satellites in orbit which are dedicated to climate change, which are, which are Indo-French. And uh, they are amazing satellites. One of them is monitoring in three-dimensional way the moisture in the atmosphere. So to schematize, you can see uh, videos of the clouds evolving. And uh, uh, if you know a little bit the fact that uh, if uh, the, the nodes uh, that you can see in the tropical regions will uh, teach you or learn you what will happen in uh, other latitudes. So actually in looking at uh, these climate effects in India, we can uh, learn a lot about what is happening to the climate in France and in Europe. So that is uh, one. The other one that we have in orbit today is typically um, uh, um, 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 a satellite which measures uh, the ocean, so the, the, the height of the ocean on millimetric basis. So it's a, it's a, it's a extremely performant satellite. And um, in uh, analyzing all of this, we have uh, done a lot of progress in uh, climate research, but we have done a lot of progress in uh, service to the common man and to the common woman, as Harriet said, uh, because um, this has, just giving you an example, with these data, we have been able to foresee monsoon events uh, on a five-day uh, distance. So we can tell the farmers uh, that uh, the heavy rain will come five days from the day we inform him. And this is a tremendous change. So this has happened already 10 years ago, but it's a tremendous change for the farmer because he can harvest and not lose his yearly production in one night of rain. So just to give you a, a glimpse of what this kind of uh, stories can, how they can help uh, everybody and um, on the ground and every, every citizen. And now we are developing together a new satellite, which is an infrared orbiter, infrared monitor, 
which will be launched by 2024-2025. And uh, this is al already uh, promising a lot of uh, new services because with this uh, kind of infrared measurements, you measure temperature on Earth in a very precise way and measuring temperature has impacts on um, uh, city management as well as, uh, you know, the, uh, the melting of the glaciers in the Himalayas and uh, it's a very extensive and multi-purpose uh, way of, um, of uh, serving new needs. So this is, uh, and the, 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 the other point on the strategical point of view is uh, the Indo-Pacific. And I, I'm um, happy that uh, my colleague uh, sitting next to me has uh, already uh, talked about it. Uh, uh, the link between, um, you know, the uh, north-south connection has developed in a very, very strong way uh, in the last, uh, I would say, five to five to ten years, and. Um, so we have uh, clearly uh, gone from, a, from an east-west type of thinking. Uh, you know, we were doing uh, the majority of our cooperation in space with the US and with Russia. Uh, we have clearly moved, not uh, necessarily stopping the other one, but adding a north-south cooperation which has taken uh, now uh, a sense of priority because of uh, defense issue, let's be clear. And uh, in Paris, uh, my colleagues from the Ministry of External Affairs are very uh, pushing for connections between France, India, and Australia. And uh, so this declines, of course, in my sector for space and uh, I'm a regional director, so I also work with uh, Australia, by the way, so it makes, um, the, the fact is that we have uh, developed a lot of cooperation uh, in space with Australia. We've been the first to sign a memorandum of understanding with the newly created Australian Space Agency in 2018, and, um, and we are now trying to find ways to work in a trilateral, trilateral way with India and I think we have very complementary uh, possibilities, capacities in the three countries to make things happen because uh, you don't make things happen if you're in competition and, uh, and if you do uh, you know, the, the same kind of things, but we're not doing the same kind of things. We have uh, complementary uh, positions and, uh, and we have all uh, capacities that the other does not necessarily have, so we could complement each other. And that's a wonderful way of, uh, doing, uh, of doing international cooperation. Now, to go more global, I, I wanted to, to say, and I will not uh, speak too long, uh, I wanted to say that, um, you know, if you want to do international cooperation, especially here in India, but uh, probably with, in, with other countries also, but here in India, because India is developing its own capacities, you uh, should find ways where you can work together without taking away the opportunity that the national country has by itself, right? If I want to work with, uh, on the Gaganyan program, I know the Gaganyan program is an Indian national program, so I should not take uh, away from India any uh, possibility to demonstrate uh, what India is capable to do. And so we need to find ways in which we work together uh, in a win-win situation where we both get advantages out of it. And uh, I wanted to give you two uh, kind of uh, examples or uh, thoughts uh, or, or, or uh, food for thought for the, for the future. One is, uh, for example, uh, bricks of technology. So I've been in this job for 10 years and I've so seen the evolution. And technological bricks is something you can work on, you know, between two countries. And you can share the technology on this brick. And you can put your, both your efforts in it. 
and your money and as uh, Dr. Short said, you, you, you make, um, uh, you, you need to invest less because you, you, you put your money together. And then you develop this brick of technology and you try to develop it in a way that it is uh, very innovative and very, uh, you know, technology of after tomorrow. And this brick, you use it on both sides. So you can use it on Indian side uh, to develop your Indian mission and we can use it on European side to develop the European missions or the French mission. And in that way, when you cooperate like that, you don't plunder the other one of any technology. You help yourself, you know, and then each, each of us goes uh, his way. So that is, um, that is one idea. And another idea I wanted to put on the table is bicompatibility. Bicompatibility is something very easy to do. You know, if you develop something like a, a launch vehicle or a, or a capsule for astronauts, before developing, before starting the development, you can say, you, are, you know, we are friends and we could share the standard of coupling of our uh, systems so that each of our system could fly on the other ones. In case of a problem, in case of commercial opportunities where, you know, from one day to the other, you need a lot of launch vehicles or it's just uh, uh, giving um, some uh, points concerning the news, which is, uh, it's the case today. We need, we have a shortage in launch vehicles. But so um, by compatibility, is something where you don't take away anything from uh, your friend, but you allow uh, the other one to have uh, the possibility to work with yourself as as long when whenever he needs it, and this is a guarantee for the future. So these are these are two ideas I wanted just to uh, to get away and uh, have you reflect on it, and. Um, I think to conclude, I would like to say, you know, everything we are doing, all of us uh, sitting here uh, as institutional uh, partners, uh, everything we are doing towards international cooperation has, has only one objective. It is, of course, to serve society, but in a second uh, time, it is to allow industry to uh, find its way, its own way, so to, to, to allow the private sector. We are preparing the ground for the private sector to make, uh, to build up its own corporations. And I think this is uh, our objective at the end of the day. So now we are in a situation where the space world is totally changing. And I think I would, I would say we, we can say we won when we see that our cooperation between government to government will in two years, five years from now, transform or be complemented by cooperation between industry and industry, because that is what we want at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, quickly, we'll move on to uh, my colleague, Dr. Vinod Kumar, who is a director promotions in this newly formed InSpace. Uh, all of us are aware of InSpace. We've heard it a lot of times. This is a new institution which has been created to promote and regulate the upcoming private industry in space sector in India. I would like to invite Dr. Vinod Kumar to share his thoughts, please. Thank you, Anita Madam respected Dr. Omar sir, and Mr. Salt and the dignitaries on the dais and off the dais. First of all, I would like to thank uh, organizers of this conference for inviting me for this very important panel, which I will tell that uh, why international cooperation is important. And as you know, I, I think most of the things are discussed by all the panelists, but however, in this space is new, we are a startup. Uh, as uh, you know, that Indian National Space Promotion and Authorization Center was formed on 24 June 2020 by the Honorable uh, Prime Ministers. Uh, the, it was formed in uh, 2020 to enable the private sector, private space company in the space sector. 
So with that vision, uh, this organization is formed and uh, we are relatively new. Uh, so what we have done is the purpose of InSpace is uh, it acts as an enabler, it promotes space, then it authorizes and uh, finally it supervises also. So we have a greater responsibility starting from the promotion to handholding to authorization. It's a four vertical. To implement all these four verticals, what we have done, the very first thing is we have developed the InSpace digital platform, uh, which is totally paperless. So you visit www.inspace.gov.in and my colleague, uh, Ms. Vijaya, deputy director with me is there. She is the architect for that. And uh, what we are seeing is uh, it is really bringing a great interest to the uh, space community of India, basically. And uh, see, they can log in online. Uh, they can put the proposal online. We will review and they will keep receiving the feedback where their proposal is. And in addition to this, we have an expert database. Uh, we have around 500 experts which are waiting to help Indian space industry. So this is the, for the information of international uh, corporation, uh, international community. Uh, one of the verticals which my directorate has is international cooperation. Of course, we are working with the Department of Space and ISRO also. And uh, we, we are always proud that ISRO has done tremendous in all aspects, and they have developed the technologies uh, in each aspect of space, whether it be launch vehicle, satellite, application sector, and they're very amazing uh, applications are also developed. You see the potential facing zones. Uh, it's, it's a work with three uh, departments, uh, fishery, fishery, space science, and so all, and earth science department. These three departments came together and developed this very unique app. And it is uh, uh, aided by, not only by LEO uh, satellite, but it is uh, also aided by Jewish stationary Navic satellite, where they give distress signal and they can go to uh, they can go to potential fishing zones. So it actually space technology help uh, saving fuels and lives also. In case of distress, the uh, fisherman can simply press a button and his location, latitude, longitude are also shared. So these are the kind of certain uh, things I am touching. Yes, we are in all vertical, and you have seen the might of ISRO by launching 36 satellites to lower thought base just uh, two, three days back. Coming to international cooperation, I think all my colleagues has uh, debated it, but there is a scope in future what we should happen. See, space has no boundaries, but we have created it. See, how I say, uh, internet, you see that geo slot is used for communication, which is kind of tube, and uh, uh, the slots are, uh, orbital slots are limited there. Now, is there, there's the opportunity in low Earth orbit, the internet uh, is possible, but we see there's a constellation. There's a, I think four or five I can see, they are launching thousands of satellites into the orbit. But what is the end result? End result is crowding of space. Not only this is one example, so there will be many other satellites. There are the satellites. So what is happening, if you see the map of uh, uh, Earth, around Earth, or 500, 600 kilometers, it's very crowded. If you see 10 centimeter kind of uh, objects, they are uh, lax. So what, what will happen? This will continue to grow. So there is a one point where comes where Kessler syndrome will come. So that Kessler syndrome means uh, what happens, there is a chances of random collision. You will not know that when collision will happen. So while there is an opportunity to use the space resources, but we should use them optimally, and we should see that our coming generation should not say that we have exhausted everything in space. So these are the certain things where uh, we can collaborate. We have seen the power of international collaboration with the International Space Station, where nobody can put that much money, the technology. So technology can be shared. So what I say basically is this, that uh, uh, we should collaborate. This is the necessity. If you have the technology in one area, share it, come work with us. Now India is open with the vision of the Honorable Prime Minister and his government, which we are implementing. Uh, India is implementing in a great way. Uh, space is open for all, and we are open for international collaboration. And uh, I'll tell you, on our uh, Indian side, we are seeing over 200 plus academia 
industry, MSME, startups, they are registered with us, and number is growing day by day. Another thing is, <clears throat> as you know that uh, India is a uh, 130 crore people, so 80% of the people live in villages. So there's a huge opportunity, be it uh, in uh, remote sensing, data processing, application development, and the vision of the government is uh, for the last mile connectivity, that's the Anto Dev, we call it. So in that you see there's a huge opportunity to come to India, collaborate uh, with us, so that will be mutually benefit for the, we can also help in each sector of, let it be blue economy, green economy, digital. Digital, we have, see, we are the record holder for number of UPI transactions. So India can do it. They have, we have done it many sectors. We is the production of the COVID vaccine. Three COVID vaccines were uh, produced. We is administering them. So there is a huge potential now in space sector. The space is open. Now, not only this, there is a possibility now on uh, space situational awareness, as I was telling. Now, one of the vertical which is we see the space transportation. You see Blue Horizon friends are there, or whether it is another company there. There is a huge rush. They tell that, yes, there are the, there are the opportunities where uh, people are, want to fly to space. You see, sometime back, uh, when we see the airports, uh, only rich will and wealthy used to fly, which is happening to space now. Now you see, I was very amazed and uh, it gives a pleasant feeling when one farmer or uh, a very poor person is sitting proudly with me in the aeroplane and he's talking that, yes, I'm very happy, I'm flying first time to the... So, Ude Desh Ka Aad Aam Aadmi, the Uran scheme of the government of India is so successful and we see that uh, there is a huge potential. Uh, in each area, because people are there. So in space transportation also, who knows tomorrow, there will be huge opportunity and people will be lining up. Only thing with the collaboration or international collaboration with the technological mixing of the countries, we can do wonders. We can bring down the cost down. We, can, we should try to reduce the space junk. That is the another part, uh, part of it. So that will help uh, develop the space transportation also. Now there is a, there is a huge opportunity. People are uh, going for colonization of the Mars and developing the technologies for, uh, uh, for habitats on the moon. So we should collaborate. Yes, there are the vast opportunities for the collaboration. One of the areas is the development of the uh, power, space power, solar power from the space to earth. There's the another very un upcoming area which you will see that uh, some of the people in India are also working on this and French I understand that uh, I was approached by IAA friends, International Academy of Astronautics, so they are also working on this. So there's a huge opportunity but it's up to the political leadership. Like we are open and uh, we are releasing our policy and FDI guidelines shortly. You will see but need of the hour is not only government to government collaboration, government to industry, industry to industry. And in space is there to help you, to enable you, to authorize you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our uh, speakers have shared their thoughts with us. And uh, I have a couple of questions of my own. But prior to that, I've been gently reminded that we have Another 10 minutes to go, that's the time we have. So I would like to open the floor for questions. Uh, if any of you have your questions, please raise your hands so that I can. Oh, wow, okay. So uh, we have the youngest audience. Uh, can you please tell us your name? Uh, Venkat. I'm sorry? My name, my name is Venkat. Hi. Uh, Venkat, Venkat, can you, uh, so please, please tell us what you would like to know uh, so that we can answer it pretty carefully. Okay, thanks. So uh, I'm very, first of all, I'm very thankful to be here. My name is Venkat Raman Patnaik and 
Uh, I'm very thankful to be here. Thanks to uh, President and Director General of SIA India, all the fraternities for allowing me to be in this uh, event, and I am very fortunate to do so. So uh, my question was like on the given description, we were uh, g coined a term called international space bridge. So can, may I know what's that? You would like to know more about international space race? Uh, space bridge. Space bridge. Yeah. OK, it's a tough question for me. So I'm going to open it to our uh, expert speakers here. So he would like to know about the International Space Bridge. So may I? Uh, as I probably mentioned, International Space Bridge, I should have been clearer. But thank you, Venkat, for the question. What I meant by that is looking at ways in which countries can collaborate with each other. But for that to work, there's got to be a very clear pillar at the beginning of the bridge and at the end of the bridge. So it's very important to know who you collaborate with in each country. There are other examples of international uh, collaboration in research. So if we look at areas that we have in society today, we wouldn't have Wi-Fi today without international space bridges built on standards. Bluetooth is another example, but even the mobile phone we have. The original space bridge could be built on what was the original MOU for mobile, for example that was signed 35 years ago last month with clear obligations in there for all the countries that signed that. And that included obligations towards coverage, mobile coverage, built, built on a consistent standard by a certain time. Secondly, consistent spectrum, consistent radio waves, uh, international roaming, the ability to use each other's network when internationally traveling, and also built on common standards. To me, there is a strong case for an international uh, space bridge between countries and between a collaboration of countries, if I can explain it that way. Thank you. Thank you. I, let me add, uh, as, uh, uh, as Dr. Short told regarding standards, what uh, Mr. Matthew told earlier also can be coined as part of space bridge only. When you have identical interfaces for a system, like your space station, for example, if your interfaces are identical, as he said, at a, maybe at a later stage when everybody is having their own space station, and if there is a distress, easily one can port into the other space station or something like that, right? So international, basically, it's a standardization of the technology that we are having so that each country or each uh, nation can interoperate if necessary. That is the point. You got it? OK. So uh, moving on, are there any other questions? Yeah, can you please, intro yeah. can uh, you please introduce yourself? Yes. Good afternoon, uh, panel. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, my name is Harini. I'm a, I'm a PhD scholar uh, working on militarization in outer space. So I would like to pose a question that would look at international collaboration much deeper in areas of security and strategic concerns. So would you look at international collaboration for regional security? Uh, international collaboration in, in a sense uh, on specific security related issues. For example, what SpaceX is doing with Ukraine or something like that. How do we look at international collaboration or should we be looking at international collaboration for strategic sector? The question is about international collaboration in strategic sector. So probably, uh, probably we can start with the... Yeah, yeah great. Uh, I can... Okay, you can hear me. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so in, I can give you an example in the, the European context um, with opportunity to kind of expand that more broadly. Uh, so one of the, the programs that we're, we're developing uh, in the European Space Agency is around civil security from space. So we are a, um, a, a civil space organization, um, but what we're looking at is ways that we can use space technology to help with uh, civil security applications, whether that is looking at uh, disaster management, protection of critical infrastructures, um, speaking on a panel just after this, talking on this exact topic. Um, so we may be able to touch on some of those points then, but this is very much looking at how we can work together within Europe, and then there may well be 
opportunity beyond that as well uh, to, to have those conversations and create that dialogue. Let's see if I may add a couple of words as someone with a legal background. <laughs> if we are talking about international collaboration in space and militarization of space, these are in fact the two sides of the same coin. One cannot exist without another. Today, for example, some people, even some, some diplomats are asking if a satellite that is providing assistance on the battlefield, a commercial satellite, can be viewed as a legitimate military target. Well, there are different views on that. And today, I think we have five international treaties on space. And there is still a gap in terms of what, what we consider. Nevertheless, it, it, it is a subject for a very professional discussion because you can never uh, strike even you consider a target as legitimate it can cause an I mean, damage that would be disproportionate so there are certain rules in even in that field which which is not yet outlined in terms of legal you know basis and it is not uh, the, this discussion has started i think uh, a couple of decades ago when when there was a war in afghanistan back then so it's very interesting topic for discussion maybe even for something to to have a closer look at thank you it's a very, very interesting question because as uh, Dimitri was uh, talking about, it, it is a reality that uh, uh, nations are, uh, uh, there is a perception in nation regarding the threat posed by the possible militarization of the space. It is a reality. So uh, uh, the collaboration, as you said, a positive kind of uh, collaboration, as something Matthew was also telling, no? it's a a kind of win-win situation for all the parties. That kind of uh, discussion, debate is very much essential. Something I will let me tell you that something which is happening in our uh, United Nations, uh, where the UN corpus, basically this is one uh, agency where uh, all the uh, nations are members and uh, this is one topic, peaceful uses of outer space is the, is, the, is the general regular topic where all these points are getting discussed. One very good, uh, very good uh, positive point of uh, that system is which, uh, which is we call Vienna culture is that there cannot be any decision based on voting. It should be consensus. So unless all countries and uh, uh, agree, then only uh, the, 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 the proposal will be passed. And once it is passed, since all states have concurred to that, they are supposed to abide by that. Uh, that is a very healthy trend. It is sustaining. It's going such 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 kind of collaboration, such kind of debate, such kind of interfaces only will help all the nations when the threat perception is a reality. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Ashwin Ahmed. I'm from Strat News Global. So I've listened to all of you. And you've talked about space collaboration, but the reality is there are two nations, the United, uh, United States and China. Both of them are much far ahead. Elon Musk is already talking about space colonies, and yesterday that was discussed. So my question is, isn't the fundamental uh, reality or the fundamental aim for all the other nations which aren't as space developed to you know, form a kind of alliance to ensure that our rights in space are safeguarded? Is that already happening? Is there any moves towards that? Because, I mean, we really do need to catch up with the US and China. Thank you. I was looking for the microphone light. <laughs> um, I'm not sure your thesis is quite correct. The opportunities in space are much bigger than two nations alone can solve. Uh, therefore, I think the thesis needs to be looked at slightly differently. And if we think about some of the applications from space, where there is a common good or a common goal, let's say Earth observation for net zero, or Earth observation for deforestation, or Earth observation for analyzing water availability, I think all of those are not a question of bifurcation between two nations. It's a question of having the facilities to serve those people that need that satellite capability. So I think before you get into anything about you know, anti-USA or anti-China, I think it's important to look at 
what is the space arena that you're talking about, and is there too much concentration? If there is too much concentration, then I think uh, other countries are bound to react. But I think where there is a common good, it's less likely we're going to get such excessive con concentration that you're pointing to. Uh, I fully agree with uh, Dr. Short. See, you are talking about USA, China, yes, technology, technically advanced, means, but it is in the context of, let us say, going to moon, going to Mars, thinking of going to Mars also there. But as he rightly said, in application area, I think there are many countries who are doing better than even US or China. It's a fact, including us. And for one good example I will tell you is, we have a Indo-US joint program is there, which is called NISR. NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar, which is a joint uh, kind of a satellite which we are going to launch in next year, which is going to benefit both the countries, the technologically as well as the application-wise. So there, there is no question of catching up with the uh, US or something like that, because we are there. Similarly with uh, CNES, we had a, a great program called uh, Megatropics, as uh, so, uh, Matthew was talking about it. Similarly, in more, more such collaborations are coming up. So, as far as applications which are essential for the society, there are a lot many more countries who are self-sufficient and who are capable technologically. The other two factors, I don't think they really matter for the genuine regular needs of the society. Okay. There are other aspects which has to be discussed separately. I agree with that. If, if I may, Matthew, and then you will comment on my comment, probably, I guess. Um, I, I will play a devil's advocate here. Uh, the, the question is legitimate, in fact. Uh, in terms of, uh, as we're here on the International Collaboration Panel, we're all like supposed to be kind-hearted and, uh, and uh, yeah, but, but uh, in fact, the one who comes first to the market sets the standard and sets the rules. The U.S. is at most probably has has a, I mean the, the space budget is is uh, like uh, combines all the budgets of all other nations in the world. Um, I've, I've been working at NATO for five years. NATO is all about standardization. So the the one who's the strongest, he sets the standards. That is why once again I would like to reiterate that we need a common ground, as Dr. Malheshwar mentioned, consensus-based decisions. Otherwise, it will be just the Wild West. That's what we sometimes see, like the Federal Communication Commission, the US FCC, is setting the standards for satellites to be oper to operate in, on, on orbit, I think, five years now, although in the, uh, in the, under the UN uh, bodies, it was like uh, 20 or 25 years or something before the orbiting, the minimum guaranteed period of, of uh, operation. So once again, we need a consensus-based decision in this regard and, uh, and uh, to maxim maximum avoid the Wild West uh, scenario in the, up there in the outer space. Thank you. Mathieu. Thank you, Dimitri. Yes, I, um, I wanted to, um, to abound to, 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 to what our, our friend said. I agree with uh, my fellow participants, but still I understand uh, very much your question and I wanted to throw in my personal experience from being in India since 10 years as a European. So uh, I have, uh, of course, my European uh, feeling and uh, all my uh, attachment to the European Space Agency. And on the other hand, uh, I've been, you know, uh, living the most exciting years in Indian space with the Indians and with you guys, and it, 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 it has changed my way of thinking and my way of living and a lot of things and um, I would be the best advocate for uh, the European Space Agency to link itself very closely to India because I'm persuaded but but intimately this comes from my heart and I'm not speaking for the French Space Agency or for the French government here I'm speaking for math okay and um, I am convinced as a person that if the European Space Agency links its forces with India, and when I say India, it's not only ISRO, it's India as a whole, Elon Musk can tremble. <laughs>
thank you so much. It's been a very interesting session. I just had a point, was in a, Please. if you don't mind. Uh, I think your question was also related to her geopolitical question. And as you saw from the responses, there was a slight friction over there. And when one-sixth of humanity starts pushing itself into space, that's the India Space Congress. Uh, so how is India rising in the space industry? Uh, when I say industry, it's a multi-billion dollar industry and India is looking to put its footprint out there and grow its exports, grow its launching capabilities. So I think as a soft power, India is growing and there is bound to be friction. And like Dr. Short said and a couple of others said, the global north has been doing a lot in the global commons, whether it's in the water and space. And now to use paraphrase Dr. Jay Shankar, the global south is moving also, and India wants to take its space out there. So yes, there's gonna be a lot of friction in terms of the new standards, and who sets the standards? How do these standards come into play? I'm not a technical person, but I see it as a layman from outside. Australia also wants to have its footprint. It's really pushing hard. It suddenly realizes that we have been dependent on others. Tomorrow, let's say, uh, China or Russia or India, someone decides they want to take some ASATs out there and do some test firing. Where does it, does it have a domino effect? Is everyone suddenly going to go back into the cave and you know, live out of no technology? So there are a lot of challenges ahead and it's a valid question and maybe her question also, we can discuss that on a separate panel altogether. Thank you back so you. much. Thank you. So uh, I think we've come to the end of the session. I would like to thank the Indian Space Congress for organizing this session. It was a pretty interesting one. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers for sharing their thoughts. Uh, it was really insightful. And once again, thank you, audience. Thank you for being, for being interactive and uh, being so absorptive. Thank you so much. Thank you.